Hey everyone, thanks for attending today's seminar, Learn the Bible in an Hour. My name is Shane, and I think we're going to have a great time today. I'm the Director of Scripture Engagement for Bibles for the World, as well as the author of Learn the Bible in a Year, Genesis to Revelation, and 365 Lessons. I've been happily married to Julene for 35 years, and our children have gone to multiplying. That's Benjamin on the left and Dimitri on the right, making us very proud grandparents. We make our home in Colorado Springs, where we enjoy the great outdoors and 250 days of sunshine almost every year. We've got a lot to cover in 60 minutes, so let's begin with prayer. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for sending your Son to die on a cross for our sins. We thank you for sending your Spirit to live within our hearts. And we thank you for your Word to direct our thoughts and steps. Open our hearts and minds to receive from you for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Bible is a collection of 66 books written by many different authors over the course of 1,500 years. It's divided into various sections, such as history in blue, poetry in pink, prophecy in orange, Christ and church in red, and the New Testament letters in green. And yet, remarkably, the Bible tells a single, unified story from beginning to end, now, this is absolutely amazing, but there is a problem. The Bible storyline is difficult to grasp because it is often interrupted by non-story material, such as poetry, prophecy, and the New Testament letters. As a result, many find the Bible disjointed and difficult to understand. So today, we'll focus on the Bible storyline and only on the Bible storyline, since that is the foundation for everything else in the Bible. Here's what I mean by that. Storyline is bedrock. It's why the first 17 books of the Old Testament are history, and why the first five books of the New Testament are history. Teaching or doctrine rests on top of it, and lifestyle or ethics rests on top of that. Today, we are only looking at the storyline. We'll begin with a rapid overview, and then we'll consider each part in some detail. Then we'll have a final review so we can all leave with a clear understanding. Now here's the rapid overview of the Bible storyline in 15 parts. Part 1 is creation, the most spectacular miracle in the Bible. Part 2 is the fall, when our first parents sinned, corrupted human nature, and brought God's curse on the earth. Part 3 is the patriarchs. God called Abraham and later his son Isaac, then Isaac's son Jacob. They are the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. Part 4 is Egypt. It's where the family of Israel moved and lived for hundreds of years. Part 5 is the desert. It's where the nation lived for a generation after Moses led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. Part 6 is the conquest when Israel conquered the Promised Land. Part 7 is the Judges. They were military leaders who ruled Israel before they had a king. Part 8 is the United Kingdom. It's when Israel was ruled by its first three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. Part 9 is the Divided Kingdom. Israel divided north and south in 931 B.C., never to reunite. Part 10 is the exile. God's people were dragged off to Babylon because of their many sins. Part 11 is the restoration. God's people returned to the Promised Land around 537 B.C. Part 12 is the silent years. No inspired words or events were recorded for hundreds of years before Christ. Part 13 is Christ, the divider of history. Everything before him is dated B.C., meaning before Christ. Everything after him is dated A.D., from the Latin Anno Domini, meaning in the year of our Lord. Part 14 is the church. It began on the day of Pentecost after Jesus rose from the dead and continues to the present. Part 15 is the return. Jesus will come back at an undisclosed time, to judge the living and the dead. We don't know exactly when this will happen, but that is where the story is going and where history is going as well. Please note that the Bible is fundamentally historical. 
It tells us how everything began, what went wrong, what God has done to fix it through His Son, Jesus Christ, and what will happen in the future. The Bible is a true and unified story of our past, present, and future. It is a story in which we find ourselves and which makes sense of the world around us. It is nothing less than the story of reality. Now let's consider each part individually, beginning with creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now there are several compelling arguments for the existence of God, but the most compelling by far is the argument from creation. That is the argument the Bible itself uses. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse, wrote Paul. In fact, if there was nothing more than a single grain of sand in the entire universe, it would still prove the existence of God, because if anything is clear to us, it's that something cannot come from nothing. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Therefore, the existence of anything proves a creator. More than a grain of sand, however, God created the entire universe to reveal his glory. The universe is like a theater of glory with earth as center stage. It's where God would send his Son to conquer sin and death and where Christ will rule the universe forever. Now here's something else to think about. If you accept the first and most spectacular miracle of the Bible, that God created everything out of nothing, there's no reason to doubt any of the biblical miracles. Ah, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too hard for you, wrote Jeremiah. Well, this brings us to part two of the Bible storyline, the fall. After God made the universe, he created our first parents and put them in the Garden of Eden. Eden is our natural habitat, which explains a few things about us. For example, if you win an all-expense-paid trip to a five-star hotel on the Mediterranean, where the only concern of the staff is to anticipate your every wish, regardless of your background, you will get used to it in about five minutes. We were made for paradise, and that's where we belong. Unfortunately, we don't live there anymore, and the Bible tells us why. Adam and Eve were free to eat from every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the devil stopped by and convinced them to do what God had forbidden, and this brought God's curse on the earth. As a result, all their offspring are born with sinful natures, and everyone dies eventually. This is the world in which we find ourselves, and the problem the Bible is going to solve. That's why, the moment after they sinned, God announced to the devil that he would send a Savior. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now this is very helpful for understanding the Bible's storyline. Like other stories, the Bible starts well. Then there is a disruption. In this case, sin. It's followed by a long and difficult quest to recover their original happiness. And here, the plot line is introduced. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. In other words, someone will come to crush the devil's head and be bitten in the process. It is the language of mortal combat. If you step on a serpent's head, it will probably die. And if it bites your heel, you could also die. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was fatal in the sense that he actually died. And through his resurrection, he dealt a fatal blow to Satan that will bring him to his end. This is the plot line of the Bible and the way back to paradise. Now don't miss this. Jesus Christ is not some guy who just showed up one day. He was promised from the very beginning and foretold by many additional prophecies so that Messiah would not be unexpected. This simply cannot be said of any other person in the history of the world. Now, back to the story. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, 
and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. Now here we see the effects of original sin. Our first parents rebelled against their maker, and their offspring became so deplorable. As a result, God would bring a catastrophic judgment on the earth. But Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. So God told Noah to build an ark in which he and his family and the animals would be saved. Then God gave him plans for the ark. Now some have doubted whether this story is true, but there are some interesting facts to support it. I'll just give you two. First, the ark was about one and a half times the size of a football field. It was 45 feet high with lower, middle, and upper decks. It was a massive structure, but credible estimates show that it was precisely the right size for the cargo. That would be hard to make up. Second, and just as remarkable, the ark was six times longer than it was wide. That's the same ratio used by modern shipbuilders, because boats built to these proportions are almost impossible to capsize. The ark was engineered by God, and the pattern is still used today. This brings us to part three of the Bible storyline, the patriarchs. At this point, the Bible becomes datable, which is very important, because the Bible is nothing like a hodgepodge of religious stories. It is more like a family history, beginning with Abraham around 2091 B.C. Notice the little white ball at the bottom left-hand corner. It will move throughout the hour as we make our way through the storyline. Now here is what God said to Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So the promised one, Jesus Christ, would come from the line of Abraham and bless the world through his gospel. But if you're going to have a nation, you will need some people. So Abraham had a son named Isaac, Isaac had a son named Jacob, and God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Then they began to increase. Jacob slash Israel had twelve sons, and his sons' families became the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel. This is very important because after Genesis 12, the whole Bible is Abraham's family history. The Old Testament is the story of his physical descendants, the nation of Israel, and the New Testament is the story of his spiritual descendants, the church. Those who have faith are children of Abraham, wrote Paul, and he is the father of us all, wrote Paul also. But there is something else you should know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though they believed in God, they also had some issues. For example, when Pharaoh wanted Abraham's wife, Abraham went along with it. That is disturbing. Isaac followed his dad's example by giving his wife to another king, which is equally disturbing. Jacob never gave up his wives, but he could be rather deceitful. And yet, surprisingly, the Bible refers to God, and God refers to himself, as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of imperfect people who truly believe in him. Well, this brings us to part four of the Bible storyline, Life in Egypt. It's about 1898 B.C., and this is how the family moved from the Promised Land down to Egypt, where they would live for more than 400 years. Long story short, Abraham's great-grandson Joseph was sold by his brothers into Egyptian slavery. But God was with him, and he rose to become second in command over Egypt. The Israelites numbered around 70 at this time and were suffering due to a famine. So Joseph brought them down to Egypt in order to care for them. There, they multiplied so rapidly that a later pharaoh felt threatened and forced them into slavery. This went on for generations until Moses showed up and said to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go. To which Pharaoh replied, I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Now, since Pharaoh admitted that he didn't know the Lord, the Lord introduced himself through a series of plagues. The Nile was turned to blood, people were covered with boils, and 
Hail destroyed the crops, and locusts ate what was left. There were a total of ten plagues, and God saved the worst for last. It was the death of the firstborn sons, also known as Passover. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, said God. God told the Israelites to slaughter a lamb and apply the blood to the doorframes of their homes. That way, when God came to kill the firstborn males, he would see the blood and pass over them. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. Pharaoh's will was finally broken, and Israel was free to go. Passover has been an important Jewish holiday ever since, but it's also important for us. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed, wrote Paul. Jesus was crucified during the Passover holiday to fulfill the imagery of the Passover lamb. But there are other parallels worth noting. Salvation was by blood on wood for the Israelites, and salvation is by blood on wood for us. The Passover lamb was to be a young male, and Jesus was a young male. The Passover lamb was to be without defect, and Jesus was without moral defect. Not a bone of the Passover lamb was to be broken, and when the soldiers came to break Jesus' legs, they saw he was already dead, so none of his bones were broken. Now back to the story. After Pharaoh let them go, Moses led God's people out of Egypt to the Red Sea around 1446 B.C. Pharaoh changed his mind, however, and sent his army to get them back. But when they tried to follow, the waters collapsed and the Egyptian army was buried at sea. Then God's people sang these words, The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. And this is very helpful for understanding what kind of story the Bible is. The Bible is not a romantic comedy or science fiction or magical fantasy. The Bible is a love story wrapped up in a war story which believers win in the end. In the history of love stories, there is no greater love story. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And in the history of war stories, there is no greater war story. The blood will flow to the horse's bridles for 180 miles. Now, women tend to favor love stories, and men tend to favor war stories. So, there is something here for everyone. Well, this brings us to part 5 of the Bible storyline, the desert. It's where the nation of Israel lived after they came out of Egypt. The dates are 1446 B.C. to 1406 B.C., 40 years in all. First, they camped in Mount Sinai for about a year, where God gave them Ten Commandments and many other laws. God was teaching his people that belonging to him has moral implications. Then they went to the Promised Land, but refused to go in because they feared the people who lived there. In fact, they wanted to go back to Egypt of all places. This made God so angry that he made them wander in the desert until most of the adults had died. But even though they displeased the Lord, he continued taking care of them. He led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He even gave them bread from heaven and water from a rock. But the one I really like is this. Their clothes did not wear out for 40 years. Now this was a miracle of preservation, which uh, they may have barely even noticed at the time. And when we get to heaven, we'll see all the ways that God cared for us, that we barely even noticed at the time. After 40 years in the desert, Moses knew he wouldn't live much longer, so he, po- he so he spoke to the Israelites about their future. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. You must listen to him, he said. Once again we hear about a promised one, and now we know that he will be like Moses. So, let's compare Jesus to Moses and see if he's the one that Moses was talking about. Moses spent his early years in Egypt, and Jesus spent his early years in Egypt. Moses gave up the glory of the palace, and Jesus gave up the glory of heaven.
Moses was the first person in the Old Testament to do miracles, and Jesus was the first person in the New Testament to do miracles. Moses gave his people commandments, and Jesus gave his people commandments. Moses fed the people bread from heaven, and Jesus multiplied bread on earth. Moses sacrificed the blood of animals, and Jesus sacrificed his own blood. Moses delivered his people from Pharaoh, and Jesus delivers his people from Satan. Moses led his people to the promised land of Canaan, and Jesus leads his people to the promised land of heaven. Jesus is the prophet like Moses, to whom we must listen. Well, this brings us to part six of the Bible storyline, the conquest. It's when Israel entered the promised land and began to take control of it. The dates are 1406 B.C. to 1375 B.C., 31 years in all. The story is told in the book of Joshua. As Moses led the nation through the Red Sea, so Joshua led them across the Jordan River on dry ground. The moment they stepped into the river, the water stopped flowing, and the moment they crossed over, the water began to flow again. We might imagine that God stopped the water right in front of them, since that is how it's often portrayed, but that is not what happened. The waters piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. The town of Adam was about 18 miles upstream, which makes us wonder, why didn't God put his hand in the river and stop the water right in front of them? Well, it doesn't actually say. However, the Jordan River is on a fault line where earthquakes are known to occur. And as recently as 1927, less than 100 years ago, the water stopped flowing at the town of Adam for 20 hours due to a mudslide. Now let's think about this. If an earthquake caused a mudslide to stop the river's flow just as the people were stepping in, that would be no less remarkable than if God did it with his own right hand. In fact, the discovery of a natural cause gives external support to the biblical record. We not only know what God did, we may even know how he did it. Furthermore, the fact that the river stopped flowing just as the people stepped in and started flowing again just as they crossed over, shows that the God of Israel is also the Lord of time. We may not always like his timing, but we can always trust it. One more thing. The book of Joshua is a military conquest, so we should not be surprised by the bloodshed. What is disturbing to some is that they were under orders from God. Now here they are. You must destroy them totally. Show them no mercy. You must destroy all the peoples the Lord our God gives over to you. Do not look on them with pity. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. So, that is what they did. Now, many have complained that the Old Testament is a bloody book and are happy to get to the New Testament with gentle Jesus meek and mild. But that doesn't work very well because Jesus promised a bloodbath that will make the Old Testament seem like child's play. Here is a verse you may not have memorized yet. Those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me, he will say. We're talking about billions of people being slaughtered at the return of Jesus Christ. Now admittedly, this isn't the most popular thing Jesus ever said, but I'm pretty sure he will not take it back and here's why. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is one and the same God. Jesus is a gentle Savior, but also a conquering King. Well, this brings us to part 7 of the Bible storyline, the Judges. The dates are 1375 B.C. to 1050 B.C., 325 years in all. The Judges were not justices so much as military leaders who delivered Israel from their enemies. Here's what happened. After Israel entered the promised land, they fell into a vicious cycle. God's people would turn away from him. Then their lives would become difficult. Then they would cry out to God for help. Then God would raise up a military leader called a judge to defeat their enemies. There were at least a dozen judges, and one of the most colorful was Samson. He had supernatural strength to oppose the Philistines until it was lost due to his sin. Then the Philistines gouged out his eyes and threw him in prison. Then, as they celebrated in the temple of Dagon, this is what they said. 
Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And while they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So Samson got between a couple pillars and prayed for his strength to return. Then he pushed with all of his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus, he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Now here's what I find interesting. For pillars to be close enough to be pushed apart is an unusual architectural feature. However, in 1972, archaeologists found a Philistine temple that was built around the time of Samson. In the center of the temple were a couple footings for pillars that were just close enough for a tall person to push them apart. Now, I'm pretty sure that the image is copyrighted, so I cannot show it here, but you can find it online if you're interested. Again, that's extra biblical support for an important biblical story. Well, this brings us to part 8 of the Bible storyline, the United Kingdom. After the judges ruled, Israel was led by its first three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. The dates are 1043 B.C. to 931 B.C., 112 years in all. Saul, David, and Solomon were not perfect, but together they turned the nation of Israel into a regional superpower. David wrote most of the Psalms and received a very special promise from God. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever, said God. So, part of God's plan was to have a son of David ruling on Israel's throne forever. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the people shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, the one who would crush the serpent's head would be descended from Abraham, bless the world through his gospel, and be a son of David, who would rule as king forever. That's why the Apostle Paul said this, No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all God's promises to put away our sin. And this is very important because even King David had a problem with sin. He was a man after God's own heart, but in a moment of weakness, he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed as part of a cover-up. That's a rather serious sin. At first, he hardened his heart. But murder and adultery are hard to get over. So several months later, David prayed, Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Now here's something interesting. The words cleanse me can also be translated unsin me, which is very good news for sinners. If you've ever done something that makes you wish you had never been born, you will want to be unsinned. And that's what the gospel is for. Those who come to God through faith in Jesus Christ receive a forgiveness that is so complete, it's like they never even sinned. For by one sacrifice, God has made perfect forever those who are being made holy, says Hebrews. In other words, if you believe in Jesus Christ and are trying to follow him, God sees you as perfect forever. Likewise, he forgave us all our sins, wrote Paul. Not some of our sins or most of our sins, but all of our sins, past, present, and even future. Now, many people go through life as though they were mostly forgiven, but that is not a biblical category. According to the Bible, we are either completely forgiven or completely unforgiven, and Jesus Christ is the key. All the sins that have ever been sinned since the beginning of human sin are absolutely powerless against one drop of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't die on a cross so that we could be mostly forgiven. He forgave us all our sins. Well, this brings us to part 9 of the Bible storyline, the divided kingdom. The dates are 931 B.C. to 586 B.C., 345 years in all. After Solomon's death in 931 B.C., the kingdom divided north and south, never to reunite. The tribes to the north kept the name Israel because they were the majority, and the tribes to the south took the name Judah because that was the largest tribe. They became known as the Jews. The northern kingdom of Israel adopted a false religion and fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. 
The southern kingdom of Judah served God occasionally, but not faithfully, and they were conquered by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. During this time of decline, God sent a series of prophets to warn his people and to tell them about their Savior. The prophet Isaiah did this rather precisely about 700 years before Christ. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now this is properly called substitutionary atonement, meaning that Jesus would be our substitute. Instead of being punished as we deserve, Jesus would be punished for us. I can't find the original source, but I have read that some ancient royal families were known to use whipping boys. When a royal child behaved badly, the whipping boy was brought in and was punished in the royal child's place. Justice was upheld, and the royal child was spared. The logic of the gospel is similar, but even more alarming. God sent his own son to be the whipping boy so that we could become his royal children. Justice was upheld, and we have been spared. Well, part 10 is the Babylonian exile. The dates are 586 B.C. to 537 B.C., 49 years in all. The Babylonians defeated the Jews and brought them back to Babylon. Like Adam and Eve outside the Garden of Eden, God's people were now outside the Promised Land, just as God had warned. If you defile the land, it will vomit you out, as it vomited out the nations that were before you, said God. So, when God's people turned away from God, they were vomited out of the promised land, just as God had said. Now, from this we learn that God does not make idle threats. We want to think that nothing God has threatened will ever happen to us, but many have found that that is not true, and we shouldn't be deceived. So, whenever you come to a verse that you don't like, I suggest you read it twice. The God of the Bible says what he does and always does what he says. But even in Babylon, God was with his people and he gave the prophet Daniel a vision of the promised one. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, he wrote. Now this is very interesting because one of Jesus' favorite self-designations was son of man. And he got it from the prophet Daniel. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him, he said. In fact, a careful study will show that Son of Man is more than a mere man. He is nothing less than the God-man, which is very important for our salvation. If Jesus was only God, he couldn't have died for the sins of man. And if he was only a man, his death would not have been enough. But since he was a man, he could die for the sins of man. And since he was truly God, his death was enough for all who believe in him. Well, this brings us to part 11 of the Bible storyline, the Restoration. The dates are 537 B.C. to 430 B.C., 107 years in all. About 49 years after the Jews were dragged off to Babylon, the Babylonians were defeated by the Persians. Then Cyrus, king of Persia, allowed the Jews to go back home and rebuild their capital city. It's recorded in the book of Ezra and is corroborated by archaeology. The Cyrus Cylinder is on display at the British Museum in London. It confirms the policy of King Cyrus to allow people in exile to return to their homelands. The Bible doesn't need external verification, but there is more of it today than ever before. Not only that, but the prophet Isaiah saw this coming 200 years beforehand and even called Cyrus by name. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. More than 200 years before Cyrus was born, the prophet Isaiah called him by name and said exactly what he would do. Now here is something else to think about. If the God of the Bible can predict the future, and no other religion can do so, then we should believe in the God of the Bible. I make known the end from the beginning, 
from ancient times what is still to come, said God. And in case you didn't know it, there are real advantages to knowing what is going to happen before it actually happens. For example, if you know which team is going to win the Super Bowl, you can bet on that team and make a fortune. Now here's a tip. God's team wins. If you get on God's team and bet on God's team, you'll win enough to live forever in a very nice neighborhood. One more thing. Please notice the tenuous relationship between Israel and the promised land. God promised the land to Abraham, but then they moved to Egypt. Moses brought them back, but then they went to Babylon. Cyrus let them return, but then they were scattered by the Romans. They went back in 1948, but they are still surrounded by their enemies. What the people of God need is a Savior who will give them the land forever. And this is the Father's promise to His Son, Jesus Christ. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Jesus had this in mind when he said to his disciples, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Notice how the vision expands from the little garden of Eden to the larger nation of Israel to the whole world under King Jesus forever. When my daughter was 10 years old, we went for a walk on a hiking trail. It went through a meadow down to a river along some rolling hills. It was a beautiful day, and the landscape was so delicious I had to make a point. You know, Sarah, the world can be so beautiful that I would fight for it if I had to, but we don't have to fight because God has said, the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. We are not just promised pie in the sky, but the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Well, this brings us to part 12 of the Bible storyline, The Silent Years. The Old Testament closes with the book of Malachi around 430 B.C., and the New Testament opens with the birth of Christ around 5 B.C. That's 425 years of silence. No prophets were prophesying, and no scripture was being written. Uh, This was a fulfillment of what God had said through the prophet Amos. The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. In other words, hearing God's word is a privilege which can be taken away due to disobedience. Nevertheless, the longer you pause sometimes, the better you will be heard. So after hundreds of years of silence, God was ready to speak through his Son. Well, this brings us to part 13 of the Bible storyline, the Christ. His dates are 5 B.C. to A.D. 30 for a total of 35 years. He was born in an obscure village to humble parents and worked an ordinary job. He never wrote a book, never held an office, and never went to college. In fact, the only credential he ever had was himself. He had a brief but powerful ministry which put him on the wrong side of the religious and political leaders. After a mockery of justice, he was nailed to a cross between two thieves. Then he was laid in a borrowed tomb through the pity of a friend. The first day passed, and nothing happened. The second day passed, and nothing happened. But on day three, Jesus rose from the dead, and today he is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, and all the kings that have ever reigned have not affected the human race so powerfully as this one solitary life. Not only that, but after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples over the course of 40 days. This is so important that we can rightly say it is foundational to our faith. And here's why. The entire New Testament is based on eyewitness testimony from credible people who were willing to suffer and die for what they saw and who never changed their story. That's a very important sentence. Even in a court of law, it is hard to do better than eyewitness testimony from credible people who are willing to suffer and die for what they saw and who never changed their story. Whether we believe the witnesses or not is up to us. We must all decide for ourselves. But if we believe the witnesses, we can also believe the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
This has been called the gospel in a sentence in the bullseye of the Bible. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, how many times you've done it, or even how many times you do it again. Listen to the words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. The God of the Bible does not give with one hand and take away with the other. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ has eternal life and always will. Now the illustration. A father was teaching his son to play ball, so he threw him a pitch and he missed. Strike one. So he threw him another pitch and he missed. Strike two. Then he threw him another pitch and he missed. Strike three. But because he was his father, he threw him another pitch and another and another until he finally learned to hit the ball. And once we're in the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ, God will never say, you're out. Well, this brings us to part 14 of the Bible storyline, the church. It began in the year A.D. 30 and continues to the present. After Jesus rose from the dead, he told his followers to make disciples. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 believed. The Apostle Paul started numerous churches and took the gospel all the way to Rome. 2,000 years later, the gospel is spread around the world, and nearly a third of all people claim to be Christians in some sense of the word. They're not all sincere, of course, but many of them are, and the gospel continues to spread. Now here's what I find interesting. After 2,000 years of getting the gospel out, Bible translators are working hard to have at least a portion of the Bible, such as the Gospel of John, in every language of the world by the year 2033. That's just 11 years from now, and it reminds us of something Jesus said. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We don't know exactly when the end will come, but we do know that it's getting closer and that we can all be part of God's end-time army, getting his word into his world. And that's what Jesus wants. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field, he said. It was a powerful metaphor in Jesus' day because many people were farmers, and few things were more important than bringing in the harvest. More recently, a farmer called his pastor with a frantic prayer request. He needed to bring in the harvest before it rained. The grain was cut, and if it got wet, it would rot. The farmer was going to town to find additional workers who usually stood at the corner until noon. But it was past noon, and the farmer begged his pastor to pray that he would find enough workers to bring in the harvest. This is the kind of urgency the church should have about harvesting souls for Christ. Well, this brings us to part 15 of the Bible storyline, The Return. Once again, we need to hear from Jesus Christ. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, end of quote. Now, at that point, there will be no more crossing over. You might see someone you love over there and want to cross over to them, or they might see you and want to cross over to you. But the time for crossing over is over. Then, everyone before the throne will hear one of two things, the best sentence they have ever heard, or the worst. To those on his right, he will say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom, prepared for you, since the creation of the world. But to those on his left he will say, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now here is what I find interesting. The Bible is the biggest story ever told, and the most remarkable story ever told, and the most powerful story ever told. It just happens to be true. Now let's review the Bible storyline one more time. Part 1 is creation. Part 2 is our fall into sin. Part 3 is the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Part 4 is Egypt, where Israel lived for more than 400 years. Part 5 is the desert, where they lived for 40 years. Part 6 is the conquest, when Israel took over the promised land. 
Part 7 is the judges. They were leaders who led the nation before they had a king. Part 8 is the United Kingdom, under Saul, David, and Solomon. Part 9 is the Divided Kingdom, when the nation split north and south. Part 10 is the Exile, when God's people were dragged off to Babylon. Part 11 is the Restoration, when God's people returned to the Promised Land. Part 12 is the Silent Years, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Part 13 is the Christ, who died for our sins and rose again. Part 14 is the church spreading the gospel around the world. Part 15 is the return when Christ will come back to judge the living and the dead. In closing, the Bible is the story of paradise lost through sin and restored to even greater glory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a true and unified story of our past, present, and future. It is nothing less than the story of reality. Well, that concludes the seminar uh, proper. Now a word from our sponsor. Bibles for the World began in 1958 and has helped distribute God's Word in over 120 countries. Our greatest concern is to bring God's Word to unreached people groups around the world. That's any group of people anywhere in the world with fewer than 2% Christians. Our strategy is to provide Gospels of John for evangelism New Testaments for new believers, and whole Bibles for seasoned believers who do not have their own. I cannot disclose the country, but this dear lady has been a Christian for decades without ever owning a Bible. You can imagine her joy and ours when we put God's Word into her hands. This is only possible because of friends like you. For more information, go to BiblesForTheWorld.org. That's BiblesForTheWorld.org. Thank you so much for your time.